HR professionals must help create a work environment that honors fairness, protects individual privacy, treats all workers with dignity and respect, while at the same time allowing the business to succeed. Rights generally do not exist in the abstract. Let's take a look. Indeed, rights are powers, privileges, or interests derived from law, nature, or tradition. Of course, defining a right presents considerable potential for disagreement. For example, does an employee have the right to privacy of communication in personal matters when using the employer's computer or company time? Moreover, legal rights may or may not correspond to certain moral rights, which opens rights up to a controversy and lawsuits. Statutory rights are the result of specific laws or statutes passed by federal, state, or local governments. Various laws grant employees certain rights at work, such as an equal employment opportunity, collective bargaining, and workplace safety. These laws and their interpretations have also been the subjects of considerable numbers of court cases because employers also have rights. Rights are offset by responsibilities, which are the obligations to perform certain tasks and duties. Employment is a reciprocal relationship in that both the employer and employee have rights and obligations. The reciprocal nature of rights and responsibilities suggests that each party in the employment relationship should ideally regard the other as having rights and should treat others' rights with respect. When individuals become employees, they take on both employment rights and responsibilities. Those obligations can be spelled out formally in a written employment contract or more likely in an employer handbook and policies disseminated to employees. An employee's contractual rights are based on a specified contract with the employer. For instance, a union and an employer negotiate a labor contract that specifies the terms, conditions, and rights that employees who are represented by the union have with the organization. The contract also spells out the company's rights and obligations. Traditionally, executives and senior managers have negotiated individual employment contracts, but they are now becoming more common for highly specialized professional and technical employees who have scarce skills. An employment contract is a formal agreement that outlines the details of employment. An employment agreement should address all particulars of the employment relationship, including base pay and incentive compensation, basic and supplementary benefits and prerequisites, key job functions and performance criteria, the contract term, and terms and conditions for terminating employment. Employment contracts may include non-compete agreements, which prohibit individuals who leave an organization from working with an employer in the same line of business for a specified period of time. A non-compete agreement may be presented as a separate contract or as a clause in an employment contract. The courts use the following guidelines to determine whether a particular non-compete agreement is acceptable. First, it sets limits on the expectations of employees not looking for work elsewhere. A typical duration is under two years. Restricts activity to a logical geographic scope. Grants employees additional consideration beyond regular employment limits employers from working within the current area of specialization, but does not prohibit employment in new fields. Contracts may also include non-piracy agreements, which bar former employers from soliciting business from former customers and clients for a specified period of time. Clauses requiring non-solicitation of current employees can be incorporated into an employment agreement. These limitations are created to protect the organization from former employees attempting to recruit former coworkers or clients, essentially poaching talent or business. An area often covered in employment contracts is protection of intellectual property and trade secrets. A 1996 law made theft of trade secrets a federal crime punishable by a fine of up to $5 million and 15 years in jail. Employer rights in this area include the following the right to keep trade secrets confidential, the right to have employees bring business opportunities to the employer first before pursuing them elsewhere, a common law copyright for works and other documents prepared by employees for their employers. The rights and responsibilities of the employee may exist only as unwritten employer expectations about what is acceptable behavior or performance on the part of the employee. 
Some court decisions have held that if an employer hires someone for an indefinite period or promises job security, the employer has created an implied contract. An implied contract is an unwritten agreement created by the actions of the parties involved. Such promises establish employee expectations, especially if there's been a long-term business relationship. The employment relationship is affected both by formal and informal agreements. The rights and responsibilities of the employee may be spelled out in a job description, an employment contract, HR policies, or a handbook, but they're often not. Employment at will is a common law doctrine stating that employers have the right to hire, fire, demote, or promote whomever they choose unless there is a law or a contract to the contrary, and employees can quit at any time with or without notice. National restrictions on employment at will include prohibitions against the use of race, age, sex, national origin, religion, and or disabilities as basis for termination. Wrongful discharge refers to the termination of an individual's employment for reasons that are illegal or improper. Constructive discharge is the process of deliberately making conditions intolerable to get an employee to quit. The courts have recognized certain exceptions to employment at will as follows. The public policy exception holds that employees can sue if fired for a reason that violates public policy. For example, an employee who was fired for filing a complaint with OSHA can sue the employer. The implied contract exception holds that employees should not be fired as long as they perform their jobs. Lawn service, promise of continued employment, and lack of criticism of job performance imply continuing employment. The good faith and fair dealing exception suggests that a covenant of good faith and fair dealing exists between employers and at-will employees. If an employer breaks this covenant by unreasonable behavior, the employee may seek legal recourse. Over the past several decades, many state courts have revisited and revised employment at will contractual provisions. Some courts have placed limits on the doctrine, including situations when employers act harmfully towards workers. Employers that run afoul of employment at will restrictions may be guilty of wrongful discharge, which involves the termination of an individual's employment for reasons that are illegal or improper. Employers can take several precautions to reduce wrongful discharge liabilities. Having a well-written employee handbook, training managers, and maintaining adequate documentation are key ways to prevent wrongful discharge. A landmark court case regarding wrongful discharge was Fortune v. National Cash Register Company in 1977. The case involved the firing of a salesperson, Mr. Fortune, who had been with National Cash Register or NCR for 25 years. Mr. Fortune was terminated shortly after he sold a large customer order that would have earned him a substantial commission. After reviewing the evidence, the court concluded that he was wrongfully discharged because NCR dismissed him to avoid paying the commission, thus violating the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Closely related to wrongful discharge is constructive discharge, which is the process of deliberately making conditions intolerable to get an employee to quit. Under normal circumstances, an employee who resigns rather than being dismissed cannot later collect damages for violations of legal rights. An exception to this rule occurs when the courts find that the working conditions were made so intolerable as to force a reasonable employee to resign. Then, the resignation is no longer considered voluntary, but is effectively an involuntary termination. Dangerous duties Insulting comments and failure to provide reasonable work are examples of actions that can lead to a claim of constructive discharge. Just cause is reasonable justification for taking employment-related action. Union contracts typically require an employer to provide for a good reason for disciplinary actions such as dismissal, but this protection does not exist in an at-will situation. Even though definitions of just cause may vary, the overall concern is fairness. To be viewed by others as just, any disciplinary action must be based on the facts of an individual case. 
Due process occurs when an employer is determining if there has been employee wrongdoing and uses a fair process to give an employee a chance to explain and defend his or her own actions. Due process, like just cause, is about fairness. Due process protects employees from unjust or arbitrary discipline or termination. This typically involves thoroughly investigating all employment actions and giving individuals an opportunity to express their concerns to objective reviewers of the facts in a given situation. Due process represents ethical and respectful treatment of employees, and companies that fail to utilize such a process risk being seen as unethical. Organizational justice is a key part of due process. Organizational justice is fairness of decisions and resource allocations in an organization. Employees' perceptions of fairness and justice in the workplace influence their attitudes and behaviors. The elements of organizational justice are explained in the following sections. Let's take a look. Individual perceptions of fairness or justice in the workplace depend on at least three different types of assessments. The process of decision making, the actual decisions made, and how the decision is explained to employees. The first factor, procedural justice, focuses on whether the procedures that lead to an action were appropriate and clearly understood and whether they provided an opportunity for employee input. Procedural justice is the perceived fairness of the processes used to make decisions about employees. In other words, are the rules fair and fairly applied to everyone? Due process is a key part of procedural justice when making promotion, pay, discipline, and other HR decisions. Second, people obviously prefer favorable outcomes for themselves. They decide the favorability of their outcomes by comparing them with the outcomes of others given their relative situations. This decision involves the concept of distributive justice, which is the perceived fairness in the distribution of outcomes. Disciplinary action based on favoritism, when some are punished and others are not, would likely be viewed as unfair. Fairness depends on employee perceptions and is ultimately a subjective determination. Interactional justice is the extent to which a person affected by an employment decision feels treated with dignity and respect. Is an adequate explanation provided to explain the decision? Is the employee treated consistently and professionally? Employees who feel that they have not been treated fairly may respond in a number of ways, sometimes even counterproductively. Organizations may improve perceptions of justice by providing procedures to deal with employee complaints. In union-free firms, the complaint procedures differ from those for unionized employees, who typically have a formal grievance procedure specified in their union contract. Due processes in union-free firms are more varied and may address a broader range of issues. Many employers use an open-door policy, which allows workers who have a complaint to talk directly to someone in management. However, this policy can be mishandled, so union-free firms benefit from having formal complaint procedures that are well-defined to provide a more systematic due process for employees than do open-door policies. High litigation costs, delays in the court system, and damage to the employer-employee relationship have prompted growth in alternative dispute resolution, known as ADR methods, such as arbitration, peer review panels, ombudsman, and mediation. For employees to trust these methods, companies should communicate decisions clearly and give employees an opportunity to provide input. Arbitration is a process that uses a neutral third party to make a binding decision, thereby eliminating the need to involve the court. Arbitration has been a common feature in union contracts. Some firms use compulsory arbitration, which requires employees to sign a pre-employment agreement stating that all disputes will be submitted to arbitration. These agreements require employees to waive their rights to pursue legal action until the completion of the arbitration process. A legal check of compulsory arbitration as part of the ADR should be done before adopting this practice. Some organizations allow their employees to appeal disciplinary actions to an internal committee of employees. This panel reviews the actions and makes recommendations or decisions. Peer review panels use fellow employees and perhaps a few managers to resolve employment disputes. 
Some organizations ensure process fairness through ombudsmen, individuals outside the normal chain of command who act as an independent problem solver for both managers and employees. At many large or medium-sized firms, ombudsmen have effectively addressed complaints about unfair treatment, employee-supervisor conflicts, and other workplace behavior issues. Ombudsmen address employee complaints and operate with a high degree of confidentiality. They can also improve employee perceptions of procedural justice. Ombudsmen, as well as other individuals and groups who oversee disputes, will sometimes use mediation as a tool for developing appropriate and fair outcomes for all parties involved. Mediators may use either a facilitative or evaluative pr approach to dispute resolution. Facilitative techniques foster communication among the parties to help uncover options for settling. The variety of ADR methods available to employers to resolve disputes in the employment relationship are broad. The right to privacy is defined in legal terms as an individual's freedom from unauthorized and unreasonable intrusion into personal affairs. The Privacy Act of 1974 was enacted to protect individual privacy rights in the United States. It includes provisions affecting HR record-keeping systems. This law applies only to federal agencies and organizations supplying services to the federal government. However, similar laws in some states with somewhat broader scopes have also been passed. For the most part, state rather than federal law regulates private employers on this issue. Record keeping and retention practices have been affected by a provision of the Americans with Disabilities Act, known as the ADA, requiring that all medical related information be maintained separately from all other confidential files. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, known as HIPAA, also includes regulations designed to protect the privacy of employee medical records. Both paper and electronic files must be safeguarded. As a result of all of the legal restrictions, many employers have established several separate files for each employee. It's important to establish access restrictions and security procedures for employee records to protect the privacy of employees and protect employers from potential liability for improper disclosure of personal information. Individual social security numbers, personal addresses, and other contact information should be protected. The Data Protection Act requires employers to keep personnel records up to date and keep only the details that are needed. The following guidelines are offered regarding employer access and storage of employee records. First, restrict access to records to a limited number of individuals. Use confidential passwords for accessing employee records about various HR databases. Set up separate files and restricted databases for particularly sensitive employee information. Purge employee records of outdated data, and release employee information only with employee consent. Personnel files and records are usually maintained for three years. However, different types of records should be maintained for shorter or longer periods of time based on various legal and regulatory standards. Another concern is how electronic records are maintained and secured, especially given advances in software, email, and mobile technology. Organizations should establish an electronic records policy to ensure legal compliance and avoid violating individuals' personal rights. Data privacy is becoming increasingly important with the growth of mobile technologies and the use of applications or apps that offer various functionality. A large number of applications collect information about users. It is vital to ensure that an organization's policies accurately and completely identify all data being collected so that users are aware of how their personal information is being handled. Three situations in which employees' freedom of speech might be restricted include expressing controversial views, whistleblowing, and using the internet and other communication-based technology. Questions of free speech can arise over the right of employees to advocate controversial viewpoints at work. Can an employee be disciplined in situations like these? The answer is likely yes if the disciplinary action can be justified by job-related reasons and the company follows due process procedures. However, simply because an employer might not be able to punish employees who make inappropriate statements that embarrass the organization, should the employer do so? 
Perhaps an employer shouldn't because employees may view this as heavy-handed and as overreaction. The best way to handle these concerns is to attempt informal resolution first, clearly outline the boundaries and standards for appropriate behavior in a formalized policy that address workplace expectations, and have a signed non-disclosure privacy agreement. Individuals who report real or perceived wrongs committed by their coworkers or employers are called whistleblowers. Several laws, such as the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the Dodd-Frank Act, protect corporate whistleblowers. For instance, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act is intended to remedy companies' ethical breaches by requiring organizations to properly report financial results, encouraging ethical businesses' practices, and providing protection to whistleblowers. The Dodd-Frank Act also protects whistleblowers and provides financial incentives to individuals who report wrongdoing. In addition to paying fines, a company that is found guilty of retaliation is required to reinstate the individual back to his or her job, provide back pay or double back pay to make up for lost compensation, and cover any costs associated with legal counsel. Employers need to address two key questions in regard to whistleblowing. First, when do employees have the right to speak out with protection from retribution? And when do employees violate the confidentiality of their jobs by speaking out? Even though the answers may be difficult to determine, retaliation against whistleblowers is clearly not appropriate or legal. The culture of the organization often affects the degree to which employees report inappropriate or illegal actions internally or resort to using outside contacts. Consequently, HR professionals should be actively involved in helping the organization develop an ethical culture by creating fair and ethical policies. Employees of private sector employers can be monitored, observed, and searched at work by representatives of the employer. Several court decisions have reaffirmed the principle that both private and public sector employers may search desks, files, lockers, and computer files without search warrants if they believe that work rules have been violated. Numerous employers have installed video surveillance systems in their workplaces. Some employers use these systems to ensure employee security, such as in parking lots, garages, and dimly lit exterior areas. Other employers have installed them on retail sales floors, in production areas, and parts and inventory rooms to reduce theft and shrinkage. It is important that employers using such methods develop a video surveillance policy, inform employees about the policy, conduct the surveillance only for legitimate business purposes, and strictly limit those who view the surveillance results. Employee morale should be considered when developing policies because employees may see monitoring systems as a sign that they are not to be trusted, which can lower their commitment and positive impressions of the organization. Employee activity may be monitored to measure performance, ensure performance quality and customer service, check for theft, and or enforce company policies and rules. The common concerns in a monitored workplace usually center not on whether monitoring should be used, but on how it should be conducted, how the information should be used, and how feedback should be communicated to employees. Organizations should strive to collect information that is needed to manage business operations, but not track every detail just because they can. A workplace investigation is not an effort to prove or disprove allegations, or to determine whether allegations are true. A workplace investigation is designed to find facts and determine what happened or what is happening in a situation. An investigator for the organization has the responsibility to look beyond the simple incident or accusation to examine the situation as a whole. The U.S. Constitution protects public sector employees in the areas of due process, search and seizure, and privacy at work, but private sector employees are not protected. Whether it occurs on or off the job, employees' unethical or illegal behavior can be a serious problem for organizations. Workplace investigations can be conducted by internal or external personnel. The following best practices should be used when conducting workplace investigations. Develop a good working plan that outlines how the organization should respond to crises before they occur. Confidentiality should be a high priority throughout the investigation, and all important incidents should be properly documented. 
specify whether human resources or another party, like an attorney or an accountant, will conduct the actual investigation of workplace incidents. If possible, select an objective and impartial investigator who does not have any professional connections to the individuals being investigated. Investigate problems quickly before evidence can be tampered with or destroyed and begin interviewing key witnesses. Investigate wrongdoing within several days after being made aware of the incident and try to finish the investigation within two weeks. Assess the credibility of individuals providing information in an investigation by looking at the following factors. Personal demeanor, credibility, chronologically, credibility of answers provided, and whether information can be corroborated as well as past and present motivations. Use the stories and information collected to conclude the investigation and recommend any remedial steps that should be taken. Present the results of investigations to key decision makers and make appropriate recommendations. Investigations serve as visible evidence that the organization takes employee concerns, policy, and procedures seriously. Moreover, investigations show that an organization will diligently research all evidence related to a claim to determine what has actually happened. This builds a confidence of fairness among those who are aware of the investigation and beyond. An investigator who remains impartial, keeps an open mind, and respects the impact of their work has a profound impact on the fairness in the organization. Policies act as general guidelines that help focus organizational actions. Policies are general in nature, whereas procedures and rules are specific to various situations. The important role of all three requires that they be reviewed regularly. Procedures provide customary methods of handling activities and are more specific than policies. Rules are specific guidelines that regulate and restrict individuals' behavior. They are similar to procedures in that they guide action and typically allow no discretion in their application. Rules reflect a management decision that action can be taken or not taken in a given situation, and they provide more specific behavioral guidelines than policies do. Coordination and shared responsibility between human resources and operating managers are necessary for HR policies, procedures, and rules to be effective. The Human Resource Group supports managers, reviews policies and disciplinary rules, and trains managers on how to use them. Often, policies, procedures, and rules are provided in employee handbooks. An employee handbook is a physical or electronic manual that explains a company's essential policies, procedures, and employee benefits. Handbooks are sometimes written in formal, legalistic fashions, but are more effective when written when employees can easily understand the content. Using more common language can make the handbook more readable and usable for employees. There are a number of best practices that a company should consider when developing an employee handbook. Several recommendations on creating a handbook include the following. Eliminate controversial phrases. For example, the phrases probationary and permanent employee may be misinterpreted to imply that employees are no longer employed at will once they've passed a training period. This wording can lead to a disagreement over what the parties meant by permanent. A more appropriate phrase is regular employee. Use disclaimers. Disclaimers should be predominantly displayed, not hidden in small texts where they're essentially overlooked and meaningless. For instance, many organizations include a disclaimer to highlight the at-will status of employees. If a company wishes to convey information about important employment limitations, it's critical that employees are aware of these disclaimers. Keep the handbook current. The contents in employee handbooks must be revisited and revised when new issues are encountered or the conditions of the workplace change. Doing so helps prevent employee grievances and complaints. Consequently, employee handbooks and HR policies should be reviewed on an ongoing basis, but at least once a year. To communicate and discuss HR information, a growing number of organizations provide employee handbooks electronically using an internet, which enables employees to access policies at any time. It also allows changes in policies to be made electronically rather than distributed as paper copies. Additionally, the handbook can be linked to related information that makes accessing details easier for employees. 
the courts have used employee handbooks against employers in lawsuits by charging a broken implied contract. This should not eliminate the use of employee handbooks as a way of communicating policies to employees. In fact, not having an employee handbook with clear HR policies can leave an organization open to costly litigation as well. A sensible approach is to first develop sound HR policies and employee handbooks to communicate them and then have legal counsel review the language contained in the handbook. HR communication focuses on the receipt and dissemination of HR data and information throughout the organization. Upward communication enables managers to learn about employees' ideas, concerns, and information needs. Organizations use surveys and employee suggestion programs to encourage upward communication. Organizations also use frequent, short questionnaires called pulse surveys to solicit anonymous employee feedback. Often delivered as a mobile app, quick surveys are pushed out to employees who can safely inform company leaders about problems or concerns in the workplace. Maintaining a healthy exchange in both top-down and bottom-up communication keeps all organization members informed and engaged with current initiatives and issues in the organization. Employees feel more connected to the organization and are more willing to offer their ideas when management supports and welcomes their input. Discipline is a process of corrective action used to enforce organizational rules. Problem employees are most often affected by the discipline system. Common disciplinary issues caused by problem employees include absenteeism, tardiness, productivity and quality deficiencies, safety violations, and insubordination. Fortunately, problem employees represent a small percentage of the workforce in most organizations. However, if managers fail to deal with problem employees promptly, work outcomes are often negatively affected and work unit relationships can become strained. Identifying violations and other behavior problems and taking steps to correct them is the responsibility primarily borne by line managers, but HR staff assist in dealing with disciplinary action. Because of legal concerns as well as justice perceptions, managers must understand discipline and know how to administer it properly. Effective discipline should be aimed at the problem behavior, not at the employees personally, because the goal is to improve performance. If a manager tolerates or ignores unacceptable behavior, other employees will see this as a tactic approval that they may also misbehave. These managerial decisions influence employees' sense of organizational justice and can lead to lowered commitment and engagement. HR professionals assist line managers in dealing with disciplinary matters. While enforcing rules and handling discipline is the primary responsibility of the manager, HR managers oversee disciplinary procedures to ensure that remedial actions follow corporate and legal guidelines, are done appropriately, and are fair and consistent. Training supervisors and managers on when and how discipline should be used is critical. Employees see disciplinary action as more fair when given by trained supervisors who base their actions on procedural justice than when discipline is carried out by untrained supervisors. Training in counseling and communication skills provide supervisors and managers with the tools necessary to deal with employee performance problems regardless of disciplinary approaches used. The best discipline is clearly self-discipline, and most people can be counted on to do their jobs effectively when they understand what's required at work. But for some people, the prospect of external discipline helps their self-discipline. The two most common approaches to discipline are positive discipline and progressive discipline. Let's take a look. The positive discipline approach builds on the philosophy that violations are actions that usually can be corrected constructively without penalty. When using this approach, managers focus on fact-finding and guidance to encourage desirable behaviors, rather than penalties to discourage undesirable behaviors. The four steps to positive discipline are as follows. First, counseling. The goal of this phase is to heighten employee awareness of organization policies and rules. Then written documentation. This stage is documented in written form, and written solutions are identified with the aim of preventing further problems from occurring. 
Third is the final warning. In a final conference, the supervisor emphasizes to the employee the importance of correcting the inappropriate action. And fourth and finally, discharge. If the employee fails to follow the action plan that was developed and problems continue, then the supervisor can discharge the employee. Progressive discipline incorporates steps that become progressively more severe and are designed to change the employee's inappropriate behavior. Most progressive discipline procedures use verbal and written reprimands and suspension before resorting to termination. Not all steps in progressive discipline are followed in every case. Certain serious offenses are exempted from the progressive procedure and may result in immediate termination. Although it appears to be similar to positive discipline, progressive discipline is more administrative and process-oriented. Following the progressive sequence ensures that both the nature and the seriousness of the problem are clearly communicated to the employee. However, if an organization has a written progressive disciplinary policy, it should be followed when immediate termination is not appropriate. Otherwise, employee's dismissal could be considered outside the normal disciplinary procedure. Employee discipline is defined as the regulations or conditions that are imposed on employees by management in order to either correct or prevent behaviors that are detrimental to an organization. A disciplinary process can demonstrate to employees the organization's commitment to due process and just cause in employment actions. However, there is a potential for a formally stated discipline process to undercut an organization's at-will provisions. Fairness in discipline is not a simple matter. Does fairness require that all employees who commit the same infraction receive the same punishment? Does it mean that organizations are forever tied to past practice? While managers are typically advised to document, 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 there can be a downside if documentation is sloppy, inconsistent, or incomplete. Documenting employee conduct issues is critical to ensure that process is done correctly. Documentation should include company performance and behavior expectations, the employee's specific failure to comply, prior warnings or counseling with the employee, expectations for future conduct, and consequences for failure to correct the deficiencies. Training for managers with regard to the discipline process should include detailed, hands-on practice in recording and documenting employee performance problems in addition to how to hold a disciplinary meeting. Managers may be reluctant to use discipline for many reasons, including organizational culture of avoiding discipline, a lack of support by higher management, fear of loss of friendship, avoidance of time loss, and fear of lawsuits. Support from human resources can help reluctant managers promptly deal with employee performance and behavior problems. As part of their own performance expectations, managers should be held accountable for enforcing all organizational policies. Regardless of the word used, termination occurs when an employee is removed from a job at an organization. Both positive and progressive approaches to discipline clearly provide employees with warnings about the seriousness of their performance problems before dismissal occurs. Termination should not take place in the heat of the moment. Even in cases that involve very serious infractions, such as an employee found drinking alcohol on the job, the employee should be suspended without pay pending an investigation. The time taken to thoroughly review the situation may save the organization time and litigation costs in the end. Terminating an individual's employment is a serious matter and one that should be taken only after conferring with HR and confirming the decision is free of bias. Managers must be careful not to move forward with these terminations too hastily, and they should get assistance from individuals in security, HR, and legal counsel when handling such cases. Utilizing an employee assistance program, known as an EAP professional, can help defuse a potentially violent situation. HR professionals and managers may face wrongful termination claims and lawsuits when they terminate an employee. These legal challenges can be based on federal, state, and local laws. To win wrongful termination lawsuits, employers need to follow appropriate HR processes when disciplinary procedures, as well as consistently documenting reasons for termination. One difficult phase of an employee termination is the removal of the dismissed employee and their personal possessions from organizational facilities. 
The standard advice from legal experts is to physically remove the employee as quickly as possible. Ex-employees are often escorted out of the building by security. Some firms allow terminated employees to return to their desks, offices, or lockers to retrieve personal items under the observation of security personnel and the department supervisor or manager. But this means the ex-employee may be seen by and talk to coworkers while upset or angry. In all cases involving employee termination, treating the employee with dignity and respect is an ethical approach and may lead to fewer lawsuits and better perceptions of the company by employees. Harsh, inhumane treatment of employees being terminated can have a chilling effect throughout an organization and serves no legitimate business purpose. In some termination situations, formal contracts may be used. One type is a separation agreement, an agreement in which a terminated employee agrees not to sue the employer in exchange for specified benefits, such as additional severance pay or other considerations. The final disciplinary phase is termination of an individual's employment, which might include a separation agreement and severance benefits.